Greetings and salutations, friends, and uh, welcome back to part two of the fifth book in the Horus Heresy series, Fulgrim. Last time we saw our hero, I guess, technically speaking, he was listening to the voices in his head, who told him that Ferris Mons was a bit of a douchebag for rushing ahead and trying to get all of the glory for Fulgrim's plan to trap the Diasporax by targeting their solar panels that were harvesting fuel for their fleet. We kind of went over the whole sanity thing there, and I think we came to a relatively decent conclusion, so I'm not going to go too much more into that. But it is also important that Fulgrim is aware that something is wrong with him, he just is trying to rationalize it away because, well, he's afraid. He's afraid that he isn't perfect, and he has to be perfect. Otherwise, the entire nature of his existence is somewhat futile. This is why he has apparently glossed over the casualty figures that happened during the Lair campaign, which is a rather interesting little tidbit, but that's all we'll really get into that. There are others, however, that are growing, well, equally insane. Fulgrim might not be noticing because everybody else is doing their damnedest to hide it, and they don't have a talking demon sword whispering sweet nothings into their ears, but Julius Cassarian is starting to get pretty far into La La Land himself. Whilst waiting for Fulgrim to show up on the bridge of the Pride of the Emperor to head off in pursuit of Ferris Manus' attack on the Diasporax, he is basically just standing there waiting for orders, and he's thinking to himself, God, this is boring. I wonder if I should just smash the face in on one of the bridge crewmen just to feel something. And when you're starting to wonder if maybe, just maybe, you shouldn't maim somebody just for the lulls of it, that is a pretty good sign that you are starting to turn just a little bit loco. Luckily for the very, very almost exceedingly unfortunate bridge crew, Fulgrim did eventually show up, somewhat pissed at Ferris's action, and decidedly unhappy with the fact that it looked like the Iron Hands might grab all of the glory, which um, is not something Fulgrim's particularly fond of, especially after the Lair thing. Granted, it was a victory, and granted it was won in wrecked speed, but already people were starting to look into the casualty figures, and they were starting to ask some uncomfortable questions. A quick and stunning victory would be the best way of making sure that anybody who had uh, started to take an interest into the Emperor's children would have something else to occupy their interests. Now obviously there was some glory to be claimed in coming up of the plan, but mm, not enough. Instead, Fulgrim had figured out something rather important. It would appear that one primary ship amongst the Diasporax fleet was seemingly controlling all the other ones. At the very least, it was probably the main command vessel of their fleet. As such, it stands to reason that if the Emperor's children were to strike at that vessel quickly and take it out of the combat, that would earn them the lion's share of the glory. However, it was a bit too far away for good old-fashioned boarding action, and such, Fulgrim decided to... Well, how do I put this? The word risky just isn't strong enough. Fulgrim decided to jump in his Firebird, alongside several other Cestus assault rhymes and boarding torpedoes, and head straight for the enemy command craft, in the middle of the enemy fleet. This, rather unsurprisingly, would be considered a ballsy action at best, and downright suicidal at worst. And to make things considerably worse, the Diasporax had shown that they were actually pretty goddamn good at this whole void combat thing, and so launching a long-range, relatively slow boarding action with boarding craft primarily rather than torpedoes... Ooh, that was pushing it. That was pushing it far beyond breaking point, and indeed, that turned out to be rather literal. The Primarch's own assault craft, the Firebird, one of the fastest, most maneuverable crafts in the entire fleet, having been produced to the Primarch's own exacting standards and customized by his own personal artifices, could not get out of the way of all of the incoming ordnance. Slowly but surely, the Diasprex fleet was focusing more and more firepower on the Firebird, slowly but surely bracketing it with firepower, cutting off all of its escape routes until eventually they had it completely boxed in. 
It was a matter of literal seconds before the Primarch Fulgrim and his personal craft were obliterated by the focused firepower of a third of the Diasporax's fleet. Moments before the very craft was turned into space dust, Ferris Manus' capital ship, the Fist of Iron, interposed itself between the enemy and the Firebird, eating a massive salvo of firepower that would have crippled any lesser craft. But the Fist of Iron is, practically speaking, a piece of armoured plating with an engine attached to it, and although even it suffered heavy damage, it was not crippled, and the sheer broadside weight of a capital ship of the Imperial Navy, of the Legioni Sestatis no less, was far more than the enemy's capital ship could handle. The command ship of the Diasprax was rendered crippled, although not destroyed, by the Fist of Iron. The crippled command ship rendered the Fist of Iron just enough cover and concealment for it to get out of the way of a salvo that might just have destroyed it. The Firebird, having been saved by Ferris's Manus' own ship, continued towards the capital ship to take out whatever remained of the command structure. The ship might be crippled, but with the Fist of Iron this badly injured, it was in no position to finish the job. The boarding action would go on ahead. Now, you might think that, seeing as he had just so very recently had his perfectly shaped and ample touch pulled from the fire, Fulgrim would be a little bit um, happy right now, would feel maybe a certain sense of gratitude towards his brother, but uh, no, not at all. In fact, this was kind of looking bad. Not only had Fulgrim overextended, but he had had his bacon saved by the Gorgon. Hmm, this wasn't going to look particularly good in the after-action report, but... At the very least, Fulgrim could still capture the enemy's command vessel and execute its admiral. That would certainly still be a massive achievement and would essentially win the battle for the Imperium side. And so he decided to take his anger out on the poor unfortunate bastards aboard the enemy's capital ship. At the very least, the poor bastards can bless themselves that they got murdered by Fulgrim before he turned forth the Neshi worshipper because God knows that being murdered by Fulgrim afterwards would have been considerably worse. At least now, they were only dying whilst having their innards painted all across the walls of their capital ship. If it had been after the Slaneshi part, well, they would have been dying just the same, but their anal virginity would not have been intact. Or, well, I say that, I don't actually have any evidence that the Diasporax weren't into lots and lots of gay sex, but, you know, I'm making a broad generalization here. Moving aside from the whole butt sex thing, I mean, come on, this is a video about Fulgrim, you didn't expect me to not touch upon it, would you? I mean, come on, seriously. All Fulgrim had to do now to claim the lion's share of the credit was to uh, slaughter his way through the command ship, arrive on the bridge, execute the undoubtedly filthy Zeno's captain, and then everything would be fine. His overextension could be swept under the rug, the casualties... Again, he'd gotten used to covering those up, so that's fine. And Ferris saving him, well, it'll be a sideshow to him taking over the enemy's flagship and routing them from the battle. It'll all be fine. Why is the door to the command bridge open? Why are the casualties everywhere? Why are the automatic sentry guns burnt out? What the fuck is Solomon Demeter doing on the bridge? Turns out that Solomon had made it here first, had overcome the resistance on the bridge, and killed the enemy's admiral. Well now, this presents a bit of a conundrum. Solomon, <laughs> being blissfully unaware of how much fucking danger him and his ass was in, simply stepped forward cheerfully, expecting accolades and thank yous, and said, The ship is yours, my lord. Fulgrim and spun on his heel and marched out. Solomon was a little bit confused as to why there was, he you know, expected at least a thank you, but really Solomon was exceedingly lucky, because Fulgrim didn't decide to wander up to him and punch his face off. Fulgrim was not happy. First, Ferris Manus had intervened and saved him, that didn't look particularly good, and now his great glory, his great victory had been stolen by a mere captain. Of course, the Demon Sword made damn sure to rub all of this in nice and properly. 
Not only did Ferris Manus not save Fulgrim, he did it for his own self-aggrandizement, not out of any sense of altruism or brotherhood. And Solomon, that sneaky little cocksucker, he had clearly gone here before Fulgrim to steal his glory. Glory that was rightfully Fulgrim's. Yeah. I can see where this is going. And so could somebody else. This is a rather interesting little aside, so Eldred Ulthran of Ulthway, that meddling little bastard, was starting to have visions again, which is always a good sign, because every time he has visions, well, everything goes to hell in a handbasket, basically. And rather blissfully for the rest of the galaxy, he hadn't been able to have any visions for a while. And wouldn't you know it, the Great Crusade advanced happily, took over tons of worlds, and it was almost at the point where the Gods of Chaos would eventually be destroyed. Then Eldred started having visions again, and everything went to shit. Granted, the primary blame of all of this still falls on hashtag blame Logar, but Eldred's also a bit of an asshole. Because here's the thing. The Eldar are always convinced they are right. They never even entertain the possibility that they might be a bunch of pointy-head nitwits who don't know what the fuck to do and really should go and just stare their ships into a sun and rid the galaxy of their meddling nonsense. Eldred had seen the death of humanity upon a world named after the end of days. Hint Armageddon, hint hint. Of course, we all know that humanity didn't end upon Armageddon. In fact, it ended with the defeat of the demonic forces under Angron, and later on, the defeat of uh, the orc warlord Gazgol Mag Uruk Thraka twice. Hell, I've done an entire series on this stuff with custom art, so you know, go off and watch that if you haven't already. But once again, this is just more evidence that the Eldar are bad people. They can't see the future, and when they can see the future, it's usually not the correct future. So, once again, it would really be for the betterment of every single sentient creature in the goddamn galaxy if the Eldar would just steer their magnificent little craft worlds into the nearest star, but hey, details. He had been having visions of a towering warrior in sea-green armor fighting through an ocean of the dead. That would be Horus, then. He noticed that this warrior was probably going to do something bad. He was also having visions of a golden warrior beneath Terra, who was about to receive a betrayal of such magnitude that it broke poor little Eldred's heart. That would be the Emperor and the betrayal would be Magnus then. He figured that he could stop all of this if only he could get in contact with another of the Emperor's sons, and as it so happened, one of these sons had recently been cruising through Eldar space whilst not colonizing and or attacking the Eldar's maiden worlds. Surely this must be somebody that Eldrad could talk to, somebody who could be made to understand the necessity of going off and telling Horus to not be a giant asshole, or if that wasn't possible, you know, silently kill him, preferably via orbital bombardment at this point. I'm extrapolating here, Eldred didn't really have that much of a plan other than meet this son of the Emperor who was behaving so nicely and tell him to continue to behave like a good boy. Presumably this would then stop the presumably inevitable fall into darkness that humanity was doomed to. Gotta say though, why doesn't Eldred, I mean, okay, so the Cabal are not tied directly to the Eldar, but I would be very surprised if Eldred didn't know of the Cabal and had some inkling of their plans. Why couldn't he toddle his happy little ass over there and go, oh, so you're in contact with one of the Primarchs, in fact two of them that pretends to be one dude, because he's a bit schizo like that. Why couldn't Eldred talk to him? Alpharis and Omegon instead of this guy. And maybe I'm presuming too much knowledge on behalf of Eldred Ulthwan, but he presumes to know everything, so I don't really think I'm being unfair towards him. But that's enough talk about the pointy-eared little traitors, we'll get back to them very soon. Meanwhile, whilst cruising through a space filled with Eldar maiden worlds... <laughs> oh shit, oh fuck. Fulgrim and the Emperor's children are having a banquet. Oh, of course it's Fulgrim. Well, that was predictable. Anyways, Adolin and his warriors have recently returned to the Legion after their 
less than amazing exploit on, amongst other planets, murder. Adolin, of course, uh, presents a somewhat different story than reality. In fact, he presents a version of reality so different that it could be uncharitably described as, um, fucking lies and bullshit, but again, details. I mean, what is really truth anyways? It's such an abstract term, isn't it? Just like imperial ownership. That also is a bit of an abstract term, isn't it? Fulgrim came across a maiden world, and he figured it was so pretty that it would be a real shame if the Imperium was to arrive and fuck it over with all of their mechanical industry and such on nonsense. It would be a real shame, in fact it tore at his very heart to so sully such a beautiful thing. Hmm. He didn't have to sully it. He could simply just move on and uh, strike it from the expeditionary's records. He could. And he would. In fact, he would ignore several worlds, and it was this very action, as we previously talked about, that brought him to the attention of Eldrad Ulthran, who figured, well, this must be a real nice guy who ignores all of our maiden worlds. Clearly, this is a reasonable Monkeg. I can talk to this, he's different, and... Well, Eldred isn't wrong when he says these things, he's uh, just not entirely aware of how different this particular human is. Eldred figured that the best way of going about this was to invite Fulgrim and some of his commanders down to a planet for a bit of a tea break, where they could discuss, oh, I don't know, um, one of Fulgrim's favourite brothers turning evil, being corrupted by the warp, and killing billions of people and turning upon the Emperor. The truly hilarious thing is, the Eldar doesn't even know how the Imperium functions. The Eldar tell Fulgrim that the warp is full of demons and horrible things, and Fulgrim's just like, no it isn't, we travel through it all the time, and Eldred's like, oh my god, you travel through the warp and yet you don't know chaos? Shock and surprise. Okay. The human empire is a secular empire. In fact, it's one of its core tenets. On every single planet they arrive at, they loudly announce that there are no gods anywhere, and they loudly decry any form of religion or belief in any kind of spirits or godly beings. And here you are, O oh great and mighty Farseer, telling me that you didn't know that the Imperium didn't believe in the gods of chaos. <laughs> Oh shit, for all of their foresight, the Eldar literally are the blindest bastards in the entire galaxy. You could hit them in the face with a 2x4 with the word Secular Empire written on it, and they would entirely fail to get the hint. And again, we are talking about a race that decided that the best way to make diplomatic overtures to the Emperor during the Great War of the Beasts was to send a squad of howling banshees into the Emperor's throne room. Because that wasn't going to piss off the Custodes or anything. <sighs> the Eldar. The just the sheer lack of planning that went into this meeting is quite literally astounding. I mean, the whole secular empire thing, that's blatant enough, but he's trying to convince Fulgrim that one of his brothers, one of his favourite brothers, by the way, is going to turn evil and burn the entire galaxy because of demons in the war. Two terms that Fulgrim doesn't even bloody understand. <laughs> he couldn't have brought some, I don't know, evidence or something? A demon, for example. Well, look at this, it's an angry creature. Oh yeah, I know one of those. It's a chaotic creature. They're in the warp. Yes, you're entirely correct, Fulgrim. But what you don't understand is they're also kind of smart. You know, at least then he'd have a chance at convincing him. Hell, he could have brought the literal avatar of Cain and went like, okay, so this is a literal manifestation of our god, yeah? It's a warp creature, alright? This is what they look like. They're demons, you call them demons, you've run into these before. Hell, when they bring an avatar later to try and kill Fulgrim, Fulgrim is like, oh yeah, I know what that is, it's an embodiment of their god of war. It would be that bloody simple. Oh, and of course, the... Most blatant and ridiculous oversight is, of course, that Eldred Ulthran, one of the most powerful psychers and farces in the entire galaxy, 
didn't notice that Fulgrim was carrying around a bloody demon sword that was whispering in his head. To be fair, I'm being a bit too hard on the poor little knife ears here. Some of this I am honestly going to lay at the feet of the author. Don't get me wrong, Graham McNeil is a really good Black Library writer and he's written some absolutely amazing Space Marine novels, but he doesn't do elves very well. I get the exact same vibes from this confrontation between Fulgrim and Elsword as I got from the Guardians of the Forest, a Warhammer fantasy book, where I felt like just parts of the plot was just missing entirely, like an explanation for why Eldred Ulthuan, one of the most powerful farces in the galaxy, didn't notice a goddamn demon sword half a meter in front of his face. Not to mention the fact that Fulgrim had arrived at the meeting looking like a full-on Slaneshi devotee drag queen, with heavy makeup, powder, swirly things drawn on his cheeks, and braided hair. As one of his more sane captains remarked, Fulgrim looked more like an artist's impression of a Primarch rather than the real thing. And yet, it has to go so far as Fulgrim actually drawing his demon sword and swinging it at Eldred before the Eldar Farseer figures that, hmm, maybe I've made a mistake here. <laughs> But hey, at least he tries to do the next best thing after having fucked up and just bring in the entire goddamn craft world through the portal right behind him to murder the Chaos Primarch and his buddies. Or at least that would have been a good plan. I mean, he tried. He sent something like two or three Gravitanks and 30 or 40 dudes to try and kill them. To kill a Primarch and his honor guard made up of veteran captains. I mean, at least he did send an avatar as well. An avatar, a molten fire monstrosity that Fulgrim proceeded to choke to death. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. I know I'm having a bit of a laugh at this entire scene, but Fulgrim literally choked a lava monster to death with his bare hands. I mean, come on, isn't that so far and gloriously over the top as to be virtually complete and utter insanity. And to be fair, I assume that Eldred didn't bring that many dudes because he figured he was coming here for a nice peaceful chat, not fighting a chaos corrupted Primarch and his honor guard. Even then though, you'd think that basic precautions would be like, okay, this'll probably be fine, I'm not planning on violence here, but just on the one in a million off chance that the vaunted Eldar diplomacy fails, Again, maybe I should bring a few thousand troops as insurance, you know, in case I have to take on a Primarch and his honor guard, not to mention the entire legion that is sitting happily in orbit. Oh well, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Didn't, unfortunately. Fulgrim survived this little confrontation after having choked the life out of a lava god. Him and his captains managed to hold out for long enough for the fleet in orbit to send down reinforcements. The Eldar simply didn't throw enough shit at them quickly enough to overrun them. And they could have. It was only Fulgrim and what, 20, 30 Astartes tops? Granted, these were his honor guards and several of his finest captains, not an inconsiderable fighting force to put it very, very mildly, but a concerted rush from Gravitanks deploying assault troops would have put them in a damn nasty position. As it was, it did not happen, and Fulgrim managed to be withdrawn back up to orbit, where he immediately gave the order to virus bomb the entire planet, along with every single planet they had passed by. All of the maiden worlds that Eldred Ulthwan had thought he had spared, Fulgrim would now return to put to the torch. And interestingly enough, the Eldar didn't do anything. Which confuses the shit out of me. The Eldar considered the Maiden Worlds to be the most prized possessions. They will literally risk annihilation to protect them. They will engage in large-scale confrontations with superior forces to protect these worlds, and they didn't even try? Okay, I guess. 
I mean, to be fair, they didn't expect this to happen. It probably would have been very, very risky to try and protect them, and they might have decided they had better things to do, but... Again, the value that the Maiden Worlds have to the Eldar cannot be overstated. They are literally the promised lands of the Eldar, their sacred homeland, the only hope and future for their species. I cannot overstate how important they are, and they just let them burn. Or at the very least, the book makes no further mention of any large-scale confrontation between the Emperor's children and the Eldar. But Fulgrim specifically says that he will see every single Eldar world burn. And seeing as Eldrad recently just told him that the worlds that he had saved were their maiden worlds... Oh, I mean, he's gonna turn around to bomb him, isn't he? Uh, I don't know, this entire part of the book, the conversation between the Eldar and the Emperor's children, all of it just strikes me as as off, as poorly planned, poorly executed, and just, in general, not very well thought through. Basically, after reading it, I'm kind of left wondering what significance did this really have upon the wider story? If, if this part of the story was just not there at all, would I feel like I was in any way losing something? Does this contribute to anything that's going to happen later, and... The answer really is... no, not really. The warning delivered by the Farseer is given at most momentary thought by Fulgrim, and even that's probably giving it a little bit too much credit, honestly. In my opinion, I think this would have been much better if it was Fulgrim himself that came to distrust the voices in his head and the War Master, it would have made his fall into insanity far more believable, because at least he would have tried to resist it, instead of just kinda rolling over and accepting it. And speaking of rolling over, we're a little bit overdue, so here, have a pointless ad. Meanwhile, now that we're done picking on the poor little knife is, Fulgrim has gone full and proper insane. Before this, he was just playing with the idea of going fully into Legoland, now he's there. Well and truly. He has had commissioned a massive painting by Serena DeAngelis. Yes, that's the same woman that's been mixing her own blood, and other things, into her paint. Is a huge, meters tall, meters wide monstrosity painted in the guts, bodily fluids, blood, feces, etc. of God only knows how many poor remembrances by Serena de Angelus. In fact, it is so hideous that the demon within Fulgrim's sword has decided to wander over into the painting. If your painting is so bad that a Slaneshi demon looks at it and goes, hmm, home. You've truly crossed the line, or seven. And again, Fulgrim seems to just kind of accept this. At least now we get kind of an explanation for why he's happy to accept that a massive hideous painting is just kind of talking to him. Apparently, the Demon Sword now has so much control over his feelings that every time he goes, huh, that's strange, it simply overwhelms them with a feeling of euphoria and satisfaction. If only this explanation would have been available you know, <laughs> when this all started. Ah, the whole slide into insanity for Fulgrim, I feel like all of it's just a little bit contrived, really. But hey, that's a personal opinion. The demon tells Fulgrim that maybe, just maybe, Horus actually is planning to betray the Emperor. And if that was to be the case, what would Fulgrim do about it? And Fulgrim rages against the idea, says it can't possibly happen, that there is no perfection in betrayal, and the demon counters by saying the Emperor, the ideal of perfection for the Emperor's children, could not be perfect if somebody is considering to betray him, because surely nobody would betray a perfect being. And if the Emperor is not perfect, then clearly the Emperor's children do not need to measure themselves up against the Emperor. The demon is essentially trying to spin a comforting lie. It knows that Fulgrim's only fear is failure. But of course, if the Emperor is an imperfect being, then clearly it is impossible for Fulgrim to fail him. 
since the Emperor wasn't worthy of his service in the first place. Now, I quite like this. This is rather clever. Not as clever as what they did to Horus. That was pretty goddamn beautiful, honestly, but the demon is playing off Fulgrim's ego and his need for perfection and his fear of failure. This is all good. My main problem is still that this is a demon talking to him. I... I can't get over the fact that Fulgrim so easily accepts all of this. I mean, it's even written in the book that Fulgrim himself marvels at the idea that he's just okay with this. Granted, it also says that any feelings of discontent or worry is quashed beneath a feeling of euphoria induced by the demon, but this wasn't the case a relatively short while ago, and it's just... it all makes Fulgrim feel really weak-willed and really easy to manipulate, which in a way I can understand, because pride is a emotion that is very easy to manipulate, but I really do feel like they are doing a massive disservice to the intellect of a Primarch with this entire storyline. I'll give you a good example, because we're just about to get to something that would be a pretty damn good illustration of what I would like to have maybe seen a bit more of. So. An envoy from the Imperial Palace, Malkidor specifically, arrives in the Emperor's Pride and tells Fulgrim that they're getting a bit worried about Horus. They've been receiving some disconcerting reports about him giving Angron far, far too much leash whilst they are prosecuting a war against the technocracy. Fulgrim is sent to make sure that Horus isn't going batty. And in so doing, he arrives upon the Warmaster's fleet in orbit around the twin worlds of the Orishan technocracy without the Warmaster's fleet noticing. Fulgrim orders his fleet to approach the Warmaster's flotilla at silent and ready running, all weapons armed, but no hails being sent out to the Warmaster's fleet, and of course, in perfect attack formation. Fulgrim considers opening fire. From this position, he could wipe out the Warmaster's expedition and end the upcoming rebellion before it had even started. And interestingly enough, he had chosen to not wear any weapons on the bridge. Not even his silver sword. Here's the thing. I like this scene because it gives you a little bit of an edge of your seat moment where you think like, oh, maybe he'll do it. You, you know he won't because <laughs> otherwise it'd be a damn short book series, but it's still a decent bit of tension build up. As Fulgrim considers for like a full two seconds that maybe the Farseer had been speaking the truth and maybe he should open fire. But before he can give the order, Lord Commander Adolin arrives with the demon sword and tells Fulgrim that he had asked for his sword. Fulgrim does not remember issuing such a decree, but he just takes the sword anyways, puts it on, and suddenly the urge to fire upon the Warmaster's fleet disappears. This is kind of interesting, so I don't doubt for a second that the sword could somehow have fucked with Aedlin's mind and made him think he had received the order. But again, Fulgrim doesn't really fight it, he just takes the sword, then all of his thoughts disappear, and he kind of just goes with it. I would have loved to see more of an actual struggle between the demon and Fulgrim. Maybe he'd come across a smaller flotilla of Sons of Horus, and he'd destroy them, and he'd have a big fight with the sword, yelling at it in his mind and actually struggling with it. I feel like Fulgrim has been portrayed as far too weak in this book so far. He has been manipulated so easily that it feels like it was never really a struggle. It was just kind of a foregone conclusion from the very beginning, and considering the beautiful finale of this book, which I won't spoil just yet, but the fact that Fulgrim kind of just gives in does sour it a fair bit in my opinion. I would have loved to see a lot more struggle between the two forces, the demon and Fulgrim. Maybe we could have been given a good look at Fulgrim before he was corrupted, when he was fully loyal, so we could really get a good grasp on the disconnect and really be able to point out the differences between Fulgrim going insane and Fulgrim before having picked up the sword, which I do feel is kind of lacking here. Now, Horus is of course a little bit surprised to find his brother so close and 
in so much of a firing position, but he composes himself and receives Fulgrim on his ship. Angron is not allowed to come because he's fucking Angron. You don't want him in any kind of um, touchy-feely political discussion, which this is definitely going to be. Horus is afraid, and unsurprisingly so, considering again the firing position, that Fulgrim has arrived with an entirely different agenda. Horus decides to try and play it off for as long as he can. Fulgrim informs him as to his full reason for being here to check on Horus on a mission from the Administratum, because why wouldn't he? Fulgrim considers the mission from the Administratum to be bullshit. Of course Horus isn't going to betray the Emperor, that's insanity. He is simply fighting a war the way it's supposed to be fought. Fast, cruel and brutal, as to make it as short as possible. Fulgrim is basically on Horus' side. Horus doesn't know that, however. And you can see that he's a bit nervous here. He still feels like the spectre of the Emperor is hanging over him a bit. He still hasn't entirely shook the idea that the Emperor knows everything. He thinks that Fulgrim has arrived to replace him. That is rather interesting. Horus hasn't f yet fully grown to be the war master yet. He hasn't fully yet grown into rebellion. He's still a little bit unsure of himself. He didn't want to confront Fulgrim just yet, clearly, but, uh, well, he doesn't have much of a choice, does he? Clearly his plans have been rushed somewhat, but he has also been given a damn good opportunity. Fulgrim has been sent to Horus on the behalf of administrators, on behalf of clerks, to chastise a brother warrior. That is exactly the kind of argument Horus loves to make. After all, this is a symptom of the crusade winding down. He tells Fulgrim that him and his brothers are about to be replaced by clerks, by administratum drones, that the Emperor is preparing to give away what they have conquered to civilians, to mere mortals, and the heroes who conquered the galaxy would be relegated to some guard position or some kind of police force, forgotten and unhonored. He spins his rebellion as not a rebellion at all, instead as a rightful stand against a traitorous father who had abandoned them all and returned to terror to surround himself with bloodless bureaucrats who would come to take everything they had fought to win. And all in all, Horus makes a pretty damn good speech out of it, and he does convince Fulgrim. Which... Again, I would have loved to see more conflict in Fulgrim. It really feels like the whole corruption thing has happened way too quickly and way too easily with far too little resistance on behalf of Fulgrim. Again, he's been fighting for the Emperor for a very, very, very long time at this point. His entire life and his belief system has been built upon the Emperor. And yet, after a very short period, relatively speaking, of time, and some whispering in his ear, which he knows to be a creature beyond his understanding, he's ready to turn traitor. I mean, compare that to Horus's story. How long it took him to turn traitor, how many trials and tribulation would have to be thrown in his way to turn him, not to mention the rather brilliant, honestly, lie that the Chaos Gods showed him, because they didn't lie to him at all. They showed him a half-truth, and he even understood that it was a half-truth. He just didn't correctly assume which part was truth and which parts were lies. This is probably my main contention with it. This book coming so swiftly after Horus makes Fulgrim feel like a much weaker character in comparison. And luckily, Fulgrim does grow to be much more of his own character later on in the book series, which I am very happy to see. So, what is Horus's plan for Fulgrim then? Well, Horus's original plan was rather different than the one he was forced to execute. First and foremost, he clearly didn't want to approach Fulgrim quite this early, but now that he'd been forced to push up his schedule, he figured he might try and make some use out of him. So he sends Fulgrim off to gain him the loyalty of the Gorgon, Ferus Manus. This is another one of those decisions that kinda confuses me. So, 
Horus and Ferris were never the closest of brothers, so I can kind of understand why he might not be entirely aware of Ferris's preferences, but Ferris is incredibly straight-laced. He is Dorn-level straight-laced. And yet Horus seems to think that he can turn him. Granted, yes, Fulgrim is probably the brother that he likes the best, but it seems like one hell of a long shot, not to mention that this would involve, naturally, revealing the fact that Horus had turned traitor to Ferris Manus, of all people. Now, you might argue that the gains outweigh the risk. After all, if Ferris can be brought over to their side, they would have a superiority in legions, which would be very important, but... Aside from Mr. Rod up his ass Rogel Dawn himself, and maybe Gilliman, I don't think I could have picked a worse Primarch to try and convince. Not only is Ferris Manus himself legendarily tight-assed, but the Iron Hands, and even before that, their cultures back on Medusa, put loyalty and honour above everything. They consider to betray their clan, their legion or their empire, to be the worst form of weakness imaginable. And they abhor weakness. And yet, Horus thinks that somehow Fulgrim can talk him into rebellion. Uh, wow, I mean, I honestly think you'd have a better chance talking Vulcan into genocide. I really don't get this decision. It's... The risk is far, far too great, and the likelihood of success far, far too little. But still, Fulgrim set off to talk to Ferris Manus. Now, one possible explanation that is hinted at is that Fulgrim himself promised that he knew how to play this, that he could definitely bring Ferris over to Horus' side, which, again, that would have been a very tempting prize since it would have ensured that Horus would have had Legion superiority, which obviously would be extremely beneficial, but I have a hard time imagining how Horus could possibly think that would work out. Again, Ferris Manus turning traitor would be directly against everything and anything Ferris Manus had ever stood for. Now, maybe Horus looked at Fulgrim and thought, okay, so Fulgrim's clearly gone batshit, Maybe I've misjudged Ferris Manus as well. After all, Fulgrim does know him better than me, so maybe there's just something I've missed, which I kinda like the sound of, because again, it does appear as if Horus is not entirely sure of himself just yet. This whole rebellion thing is very much so new territory for him, and he might have decided, okay, Maybe I'm wrong about Ferris Manus. Maybe I've read something incorrectly, and maybe Fulgrim is the one that can make this all come together for me. Even then, though, it all comes back to the Primarchs, doesn't it? On one hand, maybe I'm expecting too much of them. After all, Primarchs are failable creatures. They can fuck up. They are, well, not human, but close to it anyways. But... This just seems such a silly mission to send anyone on that I'm just really questioning how Horus could possibly have rationalized it. Anyways, before we get to the conversation between Ferus, Magnus, and Fulgrim, we do get yet another peek into Fulgrim's rather rapidly unraveling psyche. Fulgrim had now gone well and truly over the deep end, Especially, even more so, after receiving a gift from Horus, a certain sword that had not too long ago lodged itself in Horus's shoulder. That's right, the anathema. Clearly Horus was a little bit surprised, probably, at how easily he managed to convince Fulgrim and figured, alright, I've got Fulgrim to be on my side, but I'm gonna have to make sure he stays on my side. How do I do that best? Well, I know he's prideful. I should give him something that shows that I trust him more than the Emperor does. The Emperor betrayed him, I've convinced him of that, so I should show him that even if I wanted to betray him, I would not put myself in a position where I could betray him. And the best way to do that, of course, would be to give him the sword that almost killed me. 
a pretty damn smart move. And obviously, having two demonic swords in his possession is, well, not really working out all too well for uh, Fulgrim Sanity, now is it? He is clearly starting to unravel more and more quickly, and I think he's starting to see it more and more clearly in himself, whilst not being able to, even now, hit the brakes. As such, he's starting to clear out parts of his legion that is reminding him a bit too much of his old self. Amongst others, he tries to have Solomon Demeter killed in an accident. They are attacking a space station that have been overrun by orcs. Solomon Demeter and his company are dumped deep within orc-infested territory. They are promised support by two other companies, but the support never arrives, leaving Solomon and his forces overwhelmed by orcs. If it wasn't for the rapid response of a certain Saul Tarvitz and Lucius, they would certainly have been wiped out. And upon receiving the news that Solomon Demeter had almost, but not quite, been killed, Fulgrim was clearly rather disappointed and a bit shocked. When he was told that Sal Tarvitz and Lucius saved Captain Demeter, all he could say was, how courageous of them. The poor captain, unfortunate enough to deliver the news, was Vespasian, one of the last properly loyal officers in the Emperor's Children. He had become rather worried about the rather rapid degradation of the Emperor's Children, the constant introduction of new drugs and Fabius Bile's nasty little enhancement programs. He had been informed of these by Sal Tarvitz. He had requested multiple audiences with Fulgrim, but had not been granted any until this very moment. Fulgrim started ranting and raving at Vespasian, explaining to him the Warmaster's grand plan, and how the Legion would take a new step towards perfection. He eventually brought Vespasian to the hideous painting, painted by Serena Dianglos in the various guts and other awful substances of other remembrances, and Vespasian was unsurprisingly somewhat fucking shocked, oddly enough. The painting looked into Vespasian's soul and uh, found nothing but honesty and loyalty in there, which it was not particularly fond of. It told Fulgrim to kill Vespasian, which Fulgrim did, although to his credit, at the very least, he hesitated for a moment before driving the anathema down through Vespasian's shoulder and through both of his hearts. <sighs> Again, see, this is what I'm talking about. Fulgrim has gone full batshit way too bloody fast. Even Horus isn't just killing his legionaries yet. Hell, even Mortarion didn't go full wife beater until after Istvan. And yet here we have Fulgrim executing one of his oldest and most loyal friends at the words of a bloody painting. Ah, <sighs> shakes head slowly in disappointment. We'll wrap it up there. We will have a third part of this. Well, this was pretty long, but then again, Fulgrim is rather full of interesting little notes when it comes to Fulgrim himself, isn't it? Now, I do kind of feel like I'm spending too much time criticizing the rapid fall of Fulgrim, but as with all things I look at, I think it is very important to point out when I think it's doing something wrong or subpar, just that it is important to point out when they're doing something good. Like, I really loved the fall of Horus, I thought that was very well done, well executed, and it had enough meat and showed enough of the struggle in Horus's mind to really hammer home the humanity of Horus and explained why he would go to the lengths he would, whilst in the case of Fulgrim, I feel it's done far too quickly and without enough substance. Anyways, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for watching. I would like to hear your opinions on Fulgrim Psyche as well, if I might be overreacting a bit, which I'd be open to the suggestion. And of course, I hope to see you all again soon in the last and third part. Until then, have a good day.